and welcome to the Newburyport Public Schools School Committee meeting for August 14, 15th, 2016. Mrs. Kennedy, could I hear a roll call, please? Mr. DeGanda? Here. Mr. Cole is absent. Ms. Sweeney? Present. Mayor Holliday is absent. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hawkeiser is absent. <coughs> Ms. Miller? Here. And Mr. Mann? Here. Thank you. Could we stand for the pledge, please? <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. This brings us to public comment. If there is anyone in the audience who would like to address the committee, please step forward, state your name and address, and try to keep your comments to two minutes or under. Yes, Mr. Ionini. Here. Good evening, everyone. Hope everyone's had a pleasant summer. Um, just wanted to come back and follow up on the three questions I think I had asked at it was the June meeting, maybe mm -hmm. the last one before school adjourned. Uh, the three topics that had come to mind for me and are of, I think, great importance are our progress around having healthier start times for the kids and where we are on that effort. Um, our efforts around putting middle school foreign language back and what that's going to take to have a true robust program that we can be proud of. Um, and then I think tying that all together is uh, the possibility of an override and where we stand on an operating override for the schools and any other pieces in the city that require additional funding. Um, I'd like to make, if I may, I'd like to make a couple of comments and then if anybody else would like to jump in, that would, that would be great for me. Um, Jay, the healthier start times, um, I'm not going to turn it back around to you, but there's been or there is a functioning s committee. Mm -hmm. um, what has occurred since the last time you came to us with that, with the committee? It's beyond the committee now. This is an initiative that the school committee has to take leadership on. We're beyond volunteers being able to do this. The school committee has to decide, is this important for the district or not? Set a team, to get, set a team up to find out what's going to take and move it forward. So you haven't met since the last time we, we you nor came. do we have any intention to. No, I'm just I'm just trying to keep up. I understand. Um, yeah, no, there's the, we, we fully expect that the school committee superintendent and administration are going to take the charge. So, do you want to? <clears throat> Um, just that the, the North Shore um, superintendents and athletic directors um, are meeting. This is a bill. There is a there is a, as you know there is a committee at the legislative level um, that is looking at this. That suppose my understanding is that sometime by next spring they intend to have a white paper out and make recommendations. Uh, I believe that was the last blurb I read on that. Um, the, I was not able to make, although actually the last meeting was canceled. The meeting prior to that, Mike Parent attended, and there is a meeting scheduled sometime in September for the group to start meeting on a regular basis and to be looking at all the issues Got in it. terms of athletics. Got it. The athletics piece. So that's, that's where things are from, okay. from my perspective. So September, things will ramp up again? Yes. Okay. Mr. DeGanter? Yeah, I, I would just like to comment on, on the fact that. Uh, I think it's very timely that Mr. Iannini brought up his uh, list of uh, priorities because that's one of the things that we're going to be discussing, I believe, on the agenda today. Um, precisely, I think, because we ourselves feel that we need to bring more focus to certain items, uh, the items of, of the nature that you're talking about. Um, so I think it's it's timely, and I thank you for your, for your comments and support of the um, as far as foreign language, you, you know that we're um, in our first year of working decisively on our um, strategic plan. Mm -hmm. And the first um, strategy that we have decided that uh, this, the, uh, the uh, superintendent and the administrators have decided that they 
we will work on is um, stra strategy number one, which is we will reimagine teaching and learning. Um, I can't think that foreign <laughs> language and early start times wouldn't come under the work being done there. Um, and then the seventh one is? About student support. So uh, okay. I think all conversations are open. <laughs> Are you grimacing at me? Just a little, just because it's only one of the, oh, there's only one action in strategy one that's going to be the focus for this year. So I just didn't want it to go too broad. No, but I think we're going to have a conversation of priorities as mm -hmm. well. So mm -hmm. it may be that that okay. gels. That's all I was mm -hmm. saying. Good. And I, I think that the other conversation that we had at the last school committee meeting is that we have a lot of initiatives underway already. And we really don't want to add a whole lot more onto the plate right now because we're, then we're not going to be good at anything. And I just want to, I want the school committee to be cognizant of the fact that we have some very good work mm -hmm. underway mm -hmm. already that we really need to refine <laughs> and, and continue working. So. Is middle school foreign language in that? There, there, the conversation that, w that we had with the school committee, um, if I recall correct, and I don't mean to speak for anyone on the school committee, but my recollection is that we would be looking at putting together what, what would a robust foreign language program look like, what would it cost, mm -hmm. and can we have that, and, and what languages do we want to be teaching? Sure. I think last time we, we discussed this, um, someone, I can't remember if it was Steve or Bruce or who it was, but brought up the fact that some of the high school teachers had actually put together the plan. They were on a committee. And yeah. it was, yeah, there, but there, there is something, my understanding is that there is a document there that says document. This, is, this, this is a pretty good way to at least start the conversation around this. So it's not like we're at square one. There's, there's been history here. And Before my time, but there is a document. Mm -hmm. may, I, may I reply yes. to that being on the, Please. Uh, served on the committee? Uh, yeah. Uh, that document was put together about five years ago, and a lot has changed in language learning, particularly around the, the kind of technology and how sure. the technology that you can have. And uh, rather, than, I think some of the principles that we, we uh, came up with there are likely to find their way back. Uh, and uh, amongst the principles was a, a, one of the, the, the things that we were looking at is how do you build a foreign language program? Do you start at the eighth grade and then add a seventh grade and you add a sixth grade. Or yep. You say, okay, well, we've got it at the high school. Uh, we go both ways. Now we add, a, you know, eighth grade one year, kindergarten the next year, first, second, et cetera, so that you get more of the students over time uh, and engage in their foreign languages. So there's a, there was a lot of discussion. There's a lot of meat in that document, but there's also a lot of reason to take another look at it, and I think that is the wisdom of what uh, we're, we're proposing to undertake on that. Okay. And the, the, your third point, the uh, mayor has put pulled together a uh, task force. Okay, good. They're meeting for the first time, I think it's this 22nd. Week. Yeah, next week. Fantastic. Yeah, it's a, it's a sort of a, a revitalization or rebirth of the revenue task force, which you and I both served on, the yep. original one, with Rob and a number of other people. Um, and I think, if you remember, out of the last Revenue Task Force, we were able to sort of bridge the gap with, with, uh, around the idea of an override, but at least that was considered to be one of the options. It took a while to get to that point. Right? Yeah, oh, I remember it well. <laughs> we, all it. Well, we did get to the point of identifying it as an option and sure. pursue it. It didn't fly, but it, so my sense is that it's back on the table and that there's going to be conversation about it. Great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, the, and the task force is made up of community members and several of us Good. on the school committee um, volunteered as well. So, um, as I said, the, f the meeting is um, August 22nd. So that's when, um, you know, we'll understand the goals and the mm -hmm. process that we're going to go through. Good. So Good. Uh, I think, you know, we're moving along nicely. Um, we just need to keep that momentum going. So. Yeah. I know there is a there is a set time frame where j just based on hiring cycles, you need to make sure that if we're going to put it on a ballot and it's a separate ballot, that it it happens sooner than later. Sooner rather than later, so that way Susan can do whatever work she needs to do around it. I mean, I yeah. I, I feel like 
Questions one and two might be moot points if question three was answered correctly in terms of the amount of funding that this district gets. And that's 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 been the crux of it for years. So right. hopefully we can make some progress and make folks understand why it's so important and that we, we we're not just putting things back, we're we're making the district itself more robust. Um, you know, having teachers feel more fulfilled with their day and you know, it all comes back to the kids. So Okay, great. Thank you. That was all I had. Thank you guys very much. Thanks. Stay cool. <laughs> In the air conditioning. Is there any other uh, public comment at this time? Um, consent agenda. Do we have warrants, Mr. Um, uh, Manning? We do. We have, uh, we have three warrants. Um, first one is I move that the following name bills of the New Report Public Schools are not only aggregate of $686.94 be approved and forwarded to the city order for payment. There are no conflicts that may be the lowest, smallest uh, <laughs> warrant I've ever moved. Okay, I'll second. <laughs> <laughs> Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Um, I move that the following name bills of Newburyport Public Schools amount in the aggregate of $390,297.26. Be approved and forwarded to the city order for payment. There is a conflict with Mayor Holiday, but the mayor has gracefully uh, to work through that conflict with us by not being here tonight. <laughs> Could I hear a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Finally, I move that the following name bills and the for public schools amounting to the average is $37,835.12. Be approved and forwarded to the city auditor for payment. There were no conflicts on that. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, for some reason, now, uh, Mrs. Kennedy, um, we didn't we didn't get the minutes on of the last meeting we had until this evening. So I'm gonna put off um, having a you know to accept these minutes until we have a chance to um, read them so we'll accept them at our next meeting unless anyone has an objection thank you speed readers moving on superintendent's evaluation discussion um, um, if you recall at the end of our uh, uh, during our school committee last meeting uh, two weeks ago, we talked about um, the superintendent presenting us with some um, evidence on uh, progress on her goals. Um, she has some information for us this evening. It's not um, complete it's not information. Complete. Um, we understand that, uh, but we're gonna start, uh, begin discussing uh, the evidence that the superintendent is going to give us in terms of um, her evaluation. We all have copies of her evaluation document. They were put in uh, Google Docs by Mrs. Manning, so I'm hoping that um, people are familiar with them. Every, um, so to uh, Mr. Manning earlier tonight, every, you know, since I've been here, every year I have struggled with how much information to give you, not wanting to overwhelm you, but at the same time wanting to give you enough information so that, that you have a sense. So I tried to give you an example of how I think I will be moving forward in, in areas. So I'm just giving you the assessment of mathematics tonight and what I've done. And you can read this at your leisure. I'm not going to read it to you, but I'd like to tell you what's in here. I've given you some background on this. Then I've given you what our implementation was, what that looked like, and then I've given you some examples of, one, I gave you some examples of STAR 360, which is what's being used at Molen School, and to show you the progress that students have made there. And then the last item I gave you is an example of a kindergarten math DDM that is the way in which kindergarten teachers are assessing students at that level. Now I can certainly, there's many more assessments that I can give you. 
but I'm trying to give you examples of that sort of hit the standard itself and the, the goal. So you need to, what I, would, uh, what I would appreciate is that if you can look through this at your leisure and then get back to me and let me know if this works for you, if you think that I definitely need to put middle school data in there, more middle school data, or if there are things that you think are missing that you'd like to know about. So. I'd like to open up a discussion. Um, I'll, I'll begin, if I may, just by um, t uh, reiterating what the goal was. By June of 2016, I will collect the revised scope and sequence data of Eureka Math K-8 as evidence of continued progress in curriculum implementation. So I guess my first question back here is, is the scope and sequence included in this information? Um, not the entire scope and sequence, because I, I'm not sure that you, you, you want the entire scope and sequence. What I've tried to do is give you an, an example of a DDM, an example of one of the uh, another assessment that we're using and within the summary that I've given you there's a lot of data in the summary itself oh, um, <clears throat> the reason I'm asking that is <clears throat> and I, I guess super assistant superintendent Vic I'm gonna go to you a little bit um, why would well no I should ask the superintendent yep. sorry why was it so important to revise the scope and sequence um, because I, our, in yeah, our teachers were uh, not covering it in a way that got to all of the standards. So they really, this has been a work in progress, and I, what I tried to demonstrate to you is that we are making progress, and we're, we're becoming pretty, pretty successful uh, when you look at some of the scores that we see. The fact that we had such success with adding a math interventionist at Bresnahan, we have a part-time math interventionist at Molin next year, um, so I think that we're making uh, the kind of progress that we needed, but we, we did need to take a step back and look at how many lessons are, is each grade level getting through. For example, grade four got through all of their lessons this year, but they were the only grade level to get through all of them. And is, was that familiarity or work that you had done to revise? Or both? I think it was both. Okay. It really was both. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, it, you know, <coughs> Different grade levels are at different places. Um, for cool. example, the middle school, when you look at, at the middle school, and I'll pick, um, well, I'll pick seventh and eighth grade. They were looking to really make math a little bit more their own mm -hmm. instead of just the, the scripted lessons. So that what they've done is they've really enhanced some of the things that they're doing in their lessons. And there's a lot, there's, there's constant conversation around the math work. And I would say that, you know, we're, we're heading into our third uh, full year of implementation. And I would say that overall, 90% at least, 90% of the teachers, I think, are satisfied with this and really see a difference in students now. Now, I'm, I'm pulling that out of the air, but it's based on Two years ago, there was a lot more grumbling. This year, mm -hmm. I've heard a lot more positives, a lot more positives, because they see the growth that students are making, and they see the concepts that students are understanding at a young, at a younger age. Mr. DeCanter? I'm going to ask a question, which I will probably be asking of ourselves a couple of times over later on. When you think of its goal, uh, Susan, what does success look like? Um, Success looks like certainly students doing well on assessments. Mm -hmm. You certainly want that. But being on assessments a, MCAS on assessments all different kinds of assessments. Way more possible. than just way more than than okay. um, end That's of unit tests, mm -hmm. DDMs. Mm -hmm. okay. But it also looks like students having conversations around m mathematics where they're using mathematical language where they have the right vocabulary where we see that carried through there are kind of um, there are entry points uh, around the concepts that Eureka Math teaches mm -hmm. and those those concepts build and scaffold up mm -hmm. and having students really dig deep into those concepts at every grade level really gives them a very solid mathematics foundation so how do we know if the students have that? 
Um, well, we, we know it certainly based on the, as I said, all of the different kinds of assessments that we're giving. Mm -hmm. Some standardized and some not. You know, a teacher being able to say to a group of fourth graders, uh, putting a problem on the whiteboard and saying, okay, I want everybody to, to do this problem and then hold up your answers and being able to scan, scan quickly and know, yeah, everybody's got it. We can, we can now move on. This, this is, kids are understanding this or holding up the whiteboards and, you know, there are eight kids in the class that didn't get it. So now, you know, you got to go back and reteach. Mm -hmm. So um, I also think that it looks like students who will make connections in their STEM classes to what they're doing when math is being taught. Students who will come into the high school and be more prepared. You know, I'd like to see more students in eighth grade algebra. Mm -hmm. You know, are we pre preparing students to do that? Um, so I think it looks like students who get to the high school and can take high level courses and can be really challenged. So are those types of metrics on display here? Some of them are, yes. Yeah, we don't have the whole picture. Remember that this is, Eureka Math is K-8, first of all. Mm -hmm. it, it's mm -hmm. it's K-8. Okay. Um, they do, I believe, have they have a ninth grade. Um, um, they do. Mind, well, but they built algebra. Are we, are we using the ninth yeah, grade? Yeah, mm -hmm. no, not yet. But we're gonna be examining that this, this coming year. No, but the point being is that if part of your measurement of success is how well they're doing in ninth grade, whether it's Eureka Math or not, even though it only covers from K to eight, to me it would make sense that that could be part of the evidence of support. Well, yeah, I certainly think that seeing how many kids go into honest geometry, mm -hmm. you know, that's a good that's a good measure. So, mm -hmm. you know, how many kids we register in honest geometry, I think, would be a very good measure of the work that we're doing in the. Uh, in, the pre, in the previous, because yeah. um, I know it's not a one-year thing. It's yeah, so yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But so, so, so in answer to your question, uh, yes, there are some things that we could do. Anyone else? So, it, it, is there are there any places that you could cite for us that um, the scope and sequence was rearranged at a grade level? Yes. Um, and for what reason and what was the outcome? Um, okay. Um, I just said here, teachers continue to work on pacing and refinement of lessons to best meet student learning needs. Teacher teams in grades one through six met this summer to streamline assessments so they're targeting students without being redundant. Information gained from formative assessments Homework, dipsticks, exit tickets, et cetera, are used to inform daily teaching. And um, and we're also having vertical conversations. So it's not just the fifth grade teachers are talking. Sometimes the fourth and fifth grade teachers are talking, and sometimes the fifth and sixth grade teachers are talking. So I think that's important so that eventually we have a very um, scaffolded up curriculum that's going to be K all the way up through grade 12. And you know, there are various paths that students can take in mathematics. Mm -hmm. And there are various paths. I take the road less traveled. That they should, that they should take <laughs> based on, on, you know, interests, based on career choices. <coughs> but we certainly want to give them as many avenues as we can. And again, I want, to, I want to come back to one of the reasons why we picked Eureka is it has consistently been one of the very few that truly is based on the standards. And I think that becomes very important and that was a that was a key piece in why we were why we were looking at that. So anyway, any feedback that you want to once you take a look at this and that you want to give me. This is just one small example. I obviously have a lot a lot more information to get to you, but that I No, well that's why I'm asking the questions yeah. that I'm asking so that one of the things that we want to make sure is, <clears throat> as those of you who have been on the committee in past years, we want to make sure that we fully understand what the goal is so that we can then objectively, um, you know, determine progress. So 
Is there anything that um, on this committee right now that anybody would like to see added to this this one this this first goal? And and I, I won't hold you to it if you find something later that you'd like me to do. No, no, no. I understand that. I'm just Mr. Decanter. Yeah. Again, uh, as a point of comparison or, or context setting, uh, did we use Star last year? Star 360 last year. Uh, this, this is, is our first. This is our first year. This is our first year of that assessment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we're moving it into sixth grade, so it'll be fourth, fifth, and sixth. Right. No, because it would have been helpful if you say, well, 80% of our students perform proficient in STAR. Say, so that's nice, I guess. Is it right. better than last year? As good as last yeah, we year? Don't have it. We don't have the comparison so data yet. This is a baseline year. Yep. Okay, so that needs to be specified. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Let's take a look. Um, I know you don't have the evidence, but um, let's take a look at what the um, second superintendent goal is, just so that we're all on the same page as to, again, what this goal is. And I think it's important. I, I liked Mr. DeCanter's question of um, how do you know you're successful? I, I thought that was um, a good one. So I guess I'm going to ask us to not work backwards, but have have a little bit of a conversation about this goal in terms of uh, where we're going with it and what we see as as progress. So the second one is a student is a uh, district improvement goal. In order to enable stronger collaboration with the city finance department and to improve collaborative decision making around the school budget, I will develop a process and format <laughs> that will lead to identifying efficiencies and will result in the creation of the new budget format to be started for the 1617 budget and for continuous refinement in the future. Now, I think we all know, and Mr. Cole, maybe you can chime in on this, that in our uh, the finance subcommittees, we talked a lot about reformatting the way we present our budget. And as you recall, I think all of us, there was the new format this year that better matched what the city was looking for in terms of um, interreading, I guess. I, I, don't, I don't know what that, I, I, I can't figure out the word. Um, so that's one thing I note as, as progress. The second thing I note is, um, and I guess I'm telling everyone that it's happening, if you don't know, is uh, the uh, Revenue Task Force, which is, um, which will contain community members and the superintendent um, and the mayor, um, a couple of us are on that, that committee. So um, I, I can only think that our budget presentation will be, will be closer and closer to um, the cities so we can cross-reference, right? Um, yeah, the other, the other thing that I think is a big part of this, which is work that will be continuing, is that there was a grant received to work with the Abrams Group, who is facilitating looking at the chart of accounts for the city and the chart of accounts for the schools and seeing where we can, um, I won't say combine, because we'll never be able to combine them, but where we can make, we can simplify and uh, make them more easily readable. Mm -hmm. So that's work that is ongoing. The presentation of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. I had that paper with me. I didn't. I don't have it now. Mr. Cole, did you want to? Well, I just want to add. I think whatever collaboration we can uh, foster between the city, Ethan Manning, for example, and the schools, mm -hmm. Nancy Lysics, for example, is going to be helpful. You know. So. Nancy's started attending. Um, all of the the city finance meetings so that's and that's yeah that's those are key foundational are, points because right. i think we want to have those developed and established when we start getting closer to the october november time when we hear from the city what their fiscal capabilities are for the coming year which is going to be the first you know estimate of how much we can do in terms of uh, some of our strategic goals for the schools mm -hmm. Mr. DeCanter. One question that I would ask the superintendent to, to be sure she covers in her, um, in her evidence is uh, how the current budget format, the new improved budget format, uh, does in fact help her identify efficiencies um, going forward. I think that's going to be important for us to be able to talk to the community about how we're, we're running a good ship here and that we are identifying 
uh, efficiencies and no storm goes unturned, all of them. All of those other wonderful uh, metaphors we could use about financial uh, stewardship. And, and I also think we've gotten um, good feedback from Ms. Lysick at our school committee meetings as to where we are with the budget, along with uh, last time she presented us with a Munis report. Um, the Finance Committee meets every month, so um, if is there anything else that anyone would like to add or um, ask the superintendent about this goal? I want to make sure we all understand what they are and what it, what the result is. We all set? Thank you. Go to the next one. And this one I've already presented to the to the school committee. So if it, you know, if you have specific questions around the strategic plan, that's really what I would. I've, I've given you every bit of data. Right. So, so again, that's what, you know, it's our responsibility to take that data and look at it and turn it into, you know, progress and, and growth and opportunities. But I think um, to restate the goal and have this conversation about what it actually means is an exercise um, we need to go through. Um, standard one, instructional leadership. Um, the educational leader promotes, promotes the learning and growth of all students and the success of all staff by cultivating a shared vision that makes powerful teaching and learning the central focus of schooling. Comments? Again, I'd like to hear from the superintendent what, what the end game looks like. And um, of course, the strategic plan will will play a, a very large role um, in in completing some of this goal. Um, but you got to remember, this is for this last year, not the coming year when we're when we're judging um, anything. So, um, cultivated a, cultivating a shared vision. Could you just talk about that for a minute? Because I'm thinking about, I keep talking, but I'm thinking I'm about. I'm sorry, did the superintendent answer my question or was oh, he just taking notes about it? No, I, you asked a question what does the end game look like? Yes. And that, I, I will be prepared to. I will. Okay. I didn't know if you were yes. going to answer no. that right now or. No, I, I think that what the end game looks like is an operationalized strategic plan. Okay. So, I mean, that's the simplest way I can explain it to you, but I certainly can. But also um, the shared vision piece, I think, um, you know, we came a long way again with the mission statement um, for the strategic plan. And I'm kind of looking at that as the shared vision. Um, is that, in your opinion, my, a correct thing or not? Yeah, I think it's a little broader than that because mm -hmm. I think that the other piece that I would say that I think is equally important are that actually impacts that, that shared vision will be the, the clipper values. Right. And that I think that if we are holding ourselves accountable to those values, once they're rolled out to everybody and everybody's seeing what they look like, then I think that that is really the type of environment and culture we want to create within within the school committee, within each of our buildings across the district, in the community. Those are the types of um, activities and behaviors that we want to see. So I think that if we can, again, and I'll use the word because I think it's apparent to everyone, if we can operationalize those values mm -hmm. and how to answer the questions that go with each of the values, then I think that we will, we will uh, that's what the end game looks like. And who's working on the Clipper values? Well, my expectation is that everybody owns them. That, that you know, we... They're part of the strategic plan already, right? Yes, yes they are. And that we I guess my, I guess I, you know, I would need you to, to talk a little bit about how you have encouraged this culture, how, how what you're looking forward to. I don't mean to keep talking about the future. I want us to think about what's gone on this past year, because this is what we're evaluating, um, not things going on in the future. So, um, you know, again, and Mr. DeCanter's question is, is well noted, you know, 
what will you constitute as success in that? So, anyone else? Okay. Next goal is, goal is um, standard two management and operations promotes the learning and growth of all students and the success of all staff by ensuring a safe, efficient, and effective learning environment using resources to implement appropriate curriculum, staffing, and scheduling. That's a big one. Um, do we need to break it down? Do we need further? <laughs> There's a lot in that one. There's a lot in it. It's almost like two goals. Three. Three goals. Three, yeah. Um, so the first one would, would be um, promotes the learning and growth of all students. The second one is um, the success of all staff by ensuring safe and efficient and effective learning environment. And then the third one would be using resources to implement appropriate curriculum, staffing, and scheduling. That's a, that's chocolate. That's really full. Mm -hmm. So I, I would agree there are three parts to that. Anyone else? Okay. We're almost done. Standard three, family and community engagement. Promotes the learning and growth of all students and the success of all staff through effective partnerships with families, community organizations, and other stakeholders that support the mission of the school and district. Develops and maintains strong working relationships with political and other uh, stakeholders in the community. Any question about that goal? Clarity, anything you want to? That seems to be one that um, is, is an important one for the school committee, too. It's always reflected in our self-evaluation. So I think we're all on the same page with that one and the necessity of, you know. Um, but Mr. Menon had asked me a really good question. Um, um, actually, Mr. Menon, you, you said several of them, which all made sense to me, and I wish I had it in front of me. Do you have your... I don't have it in front of me. Um, it it talked know. about um, who do we communicate to, um, who communicates to us. There were other parts that well, I really we liked. With them. Um, but communication seems to be a big one. Um, what is our responsibility? What information? Who are we to? How are we communicating? There you go. What are we communicating and how are we listening? To whom are we how listening? How are we listening? Yeah. How are we demonstrating that we understand and have created action steps around what we've heard? So So I think those, you know, I don't know if you jotted them all down or not. I did them all, but um, I could forward those yeah. too. Could you yeah, uh, right send mm -hmm. those? Um, because I think those were really good questions to focus the communication discussion on. And I think it's come up, again, communication is way up there for us. So the more we can um, get information. Um, Thank you. And then the last one is uh, standard for professional culture. Promotes success for all students by nurturing and sustaining a school culture of reflective practice, high expectations, and continuous learning for staff. Any questions on that one? Anything you'd like to? Mm -hmm. Is everybody clear on what that success would look like? <laughs> okay. Um, Susan, I'm going to ask you when you think you can get your information to us because I want to start a timeline for this. Um, and I don't want to go much into this new school year without this work being no. done so we can move forward. And I'm going to say that to the school committee as far as our self-evaluation goes, too. I'm going to push for end dates. <laughs> what? Are you making a face at me? <laughs> so, um, because then we have to come back and, and, you know, present our results. We need to collate that. Um, Mr. DeCanter has volunteered to do that again with the cover sheets that he had last um, year. So I think we're on our way to that. Um, this is our last meeting in um, August. Um, right, our next one is the 5th of September. No, that's not. No, it's the 6th. It's the 6th because it's Labor Day. Yeah. Okay. Um, it would help if I looked on the right phone. <laughs> well, it helps if you only have one. <laughs> I'm not important enough to have two. Well, no, what I will do is, let me just look here for a minute. 
um, our meeting is the 6th, then... The next one's the 20th, I think. Yeah, yeah. This, this 20th is too late. Um, if the next one is the 6th, then why don't I... Is, is How much time does the school committee need to review all this? And um, I think someone stated at our last meeting, and I, I would agree that, um, you know, sometimes when you have an extended deadline, it works against you, right. you know, you, yep. and um, we're fresh off this conversation <laughs> of understanding now, so I kind of want to, um, I don't know, I'm going to ask other people who have full-time jobs that I don't have, um, would a week be a turn, here are the steps. You would get Susan's information. Um, you would begin to write um, school committee members note areas of strength based on Susan's information, but also based on our own um, observations. We, we have a big part in this as well. And then um, the second part of it is growth and development opportunities, which would be where we would comment on where we, we would like to see things going or um, suggestions for continued growth. So I happen to do mine in bullets. I don't do big narratives. I do bullets. Um, so how, again, I'm going to ask you people, um, how long would it take you to turn this around? Because then we need to get it to Mr. DeCanter, who does magic with it and comes out with our summary. So given the fact that we have two weeks till our next meeting, what are, what are your druthers? When will we receive the... We actually have three. We have three weeks. When do, when do we receive the evidence? I was just asking, how much time do you need yeah, she's to She's asking us right? backwards to... Because that, that allows me to... So it doesn't help that I'm trying to reverse it on her? <laughs> no. <laughs> nope, it doesn't. I asked first. <laughs> she did. <laughs> when would we like all of her evidence? How about... What? I think given the first week of school is yeah. the last week of August, it's going to be... That is going to be dicey for for everyone. Yeah, <laughs> for everyone. But but I you know I I um, just need to. But if you just split it down know. the middle, how would that look? Yep. Um, Three weeks divided by two. We can somewhere between ten and twelve days away. Yeah. So that would mean that I would get the information on our. When do we want to have the report back to the superintendent? As soon as possible is my... I know that. Are we looking at... Is that going to be part of our agenda on the 6th, or is it going to be part of our agenda on the 19th? I think we're going to have to wait till the 19th. I... I, I, I would tend to agree. Um, only because we need to get... You know, there's so many steps in this process, and I want us to do it right. But I want, you know, and I know we'll do it diligently and move along so that we can get on with this year. So if I if I get the information by Friday the night, oh, I'm in great can, shape. I, no, I'm, I'm talking no, about everybody's us, evaluation not you. Yeah. Okay. for for compiling. Uh, if we're not going to the until the 19th, I'm sorry, the 20th. No, Monday the 19th. Um, 20th or oh, I'm sorry. That's because of the Tuesday. Yeah. Monday um, the 19th. Monday the 19th. Um, we would be able to report back out. Yeah. Is that okay with everyone? So we got it from Susan 10 days from now, and then we need our results into me by the 9th. Does that work for everyone? Yay or nay? Mm -hmm. yeah, works okay. Nice. Does that work for you? Yeah, um, I'm, I might ask if I can have through the weekend of if that Sunday, the 28th, to pull that together. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other thing I would say, um, Superintendent, yeah. is, you know, if you get the, I don't mind if you get a goal done and you send it to us mm -hmm. so that we could start working on the pieces as well. They don't necessarily have to all be interconnected. Mm -hmm. So, like you did well, they're tonight. Not, they're not interconnected. But that's my yeah. point. So they are and they aren't. Like you did tonight yep. with, with the Eureka. Yep. Um, and then 
I will then focus on this one when and then move on when you give me more information. So is that okay with everyone else or? And if I overwhelm you with data, you don't have to read it all. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yes, we do. <laughs> we'll read it. All right. Great. Thank you, everyone. Any questions about that? Everybody's comfortable? Okay. School safety. Yep. I wanted to give you a progress update on what's happening at the high school. Um, we have two... Um, Two contractors are currently on site here in the high school that are working on uh, the security. Uh, Jupiter Electric and um, uh, Tyco Simplex uh, have been on site since the middle of July. Cabling and conduits have been installed throughout the building for the cameras and some of the door access wiring. Um, installation of cameras is now going on throughout the building. Uh, door, door hardware submittals were just approved last week by GGD. And the first set of submittals did not meet the specifications, so they were rejected. That held us up a little bit. But, but my point is, is that GGD will make sure that we have the right equipment and that we, so that's not a bad thing. Um, the door hardware has, um, I, I'm not sure if it happened today or not, but it should have been ordered today. And it's going to take several weeks to be delivered. Um, Steve Burkholm, I asked him to try to get me an update on the timeline itself so that we could have, you could um, have a better understanding of what that would be. All of the infrastructure work will be done before school starts. So once school is in session, all of the work that has to be done is going to be on the door. It will be at the doors or in the wiring closets. Um, and they've already started the quarry process for any workers who will be here once school starts. And uh, we appear to still be on track to be complete by the October 21st project completion date. Questions, comments? We are a little over budget, but we are, um, we have money in building maintenance that will cover the shortfall. Did we have to cut down on the cameras at the high school? We did. And so what's the ratio there? Oh, we have more cameras. We have many, many cameras in this building. We'll have a lot of cameras in this building. So, so that's not a concern? It's not a concern. No, okay. it's not a concern. The fact that we have additional <coughs> cameras that are going to be in critical places that we didn't have them before, that's the, that's, okay. that's the good news. Um, and as you know, certainly my concern has been the entrance into the building. Right. And that, that should be, that will be secured and that will, we'll have a new process for that by October 21st at the latest, and it, hopefully it will be sooner than that. And the superintendent will have keys. <laughs> the superintendent will, the <laughs> superintendent will have a, a, a fob to switch. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. McCarroll, what is the date of October 1st? 21st. Thank you. And I'm going to apologize to the committee before we move on because I found the papers that I didn't think I had with me. This is, um, we voted on these, approved by the school committee December 7th, 2015. And these were the new report district goals. And in these were also all kinds of action steps. So when you're filling out or you're looking at the superintendent's evaluation, again, I would suggest that you look at this as evidence that was presented to us. Um, so can you get us copies of that? Um, yes. Um, it, it's not dated for me, yeah. but we voted on it on December 7th. 2015? Yes. All right, so we could go back into the minutes and find it too, maybe? I, I can or, vote it to you. Okay, all right. Yeah, I, just to make it easier okay. because I, w I was looking at this today and all of your goals are here and pretty well delineated or defined. So this is another bit of evidence we can take a look at when we're looking at our action steps. Um, these are the three uh, professional goals, not the standard goals. So. Um, that's another piece. I'm sorry, I was looking for that and I, didn't, I couldn't find it. Um, update on STEM. Superintendent or the assistant superintendent? Oh, we can both update, yeah, but I'll, okay. I, will, I will let assistant superintendent Beck start off. Okay. Um, 
We've had a lot of good things uh, happening in the district around STEM. It's been a busy summer. And I really have to give a shout out to the NEF because they have really allowed us to accelerate the work in the area of STEM by supporting us um, the way that they have. We just took a tour today um, with one of the people who um, made a large donation towards the new STEM room at the Bresnahan or the STEM lab at the Bresnahan. So we took that person over today so that they could see how the, what the room's going to look like and um, how the different learning modules will move in and out of the space and how we can make that space a flexible space so that it includes robotics and maker spaces and um, science inquiry space. Well, and <laughs> Yeah, it's very fun. It's very fun. And is this a donor through NEF? It is. Okay. It's a not donor through to, NEF. Not to be mentioned or... I didn't know if we would give kudos or a plaque uh, or something. I don't know. Oh, yes. The person, there'll be a naming um, in the room for for this person. So I don't know. Do I mention this person? I don't think it Mr. would be DeCantor, a problem. Do you know the person? I think I know the person, but I'm oh, not sure. I know you were on the board. I was going to make him say it rather right. than you. <laughs> Yeah, you know, this has been, it, it was Mike Strem. I don't think oh. that, and there's any reason why we can't disclose that. And Mike has been a supporter of science education in the district for as long as Incredible. I've been in the district. He's been very generous to the school district in this area. As a scientist himself, mm. it's very close to his heart. So, He's um, been amazing. Yeah, really amazing. And um, the NEF is working uh, very hard um, to support the work we're doing, both at, across the elementary grades. They're supporting, um, they're supporting us at the Mullen School as well. So um, we have uh, hired a point eight teacher um, who will be uh, working in the STEM lab, and uh, she will be facilitating some of the learning for the students and modeling for the teachers. And um, she's very excited about this position. She has 11 years experience at the Sparhawk School oh. in Amesbury, and um, so. Who's the, who's the person? Um, her name is Kristen Spinney. Kristen Spinney. And she's very excited. She was there today to meet everybody and um, just so enthusiastic. We've, um, we've got some core uh, curriculum resources in through the Museum of Science, uh, through their programming called um, STEM is Elementary. And, um, and so there's some great units of study there that she'll start the work with. Um, but we've also um, got several other resources that we'll be using to support the types of education that are happening there. But we've been able to order some furniture, some of the tools of science, get the room equipped that way, some of the safety equipment that we're going to need for the students to start. So um, this was really a huge bit boost to getting it up and running for September. So we're very excited about that. And um, we've got excited programming expanding at the Mullen School as well. And um, I wanted to share with you the case statement um, that the NEF has put together that's going out to um, all of their donors and people in major gifts. Did you say case? Case, yes. It's just a case statement around why you might make a donation towards this effort. And this is something we worked on and then, um, you know, Liz Kinsley and I put a lot of the information together and then the NEF boiled it down a little bit um, in a way that the donors might like to hear it. But it, it does give you an idea of what this first phase of our district STEM integration initiative is all about. And um, it's, it's very exciting. 
we're naturally we've got things underway at the, at our high school that you've heard about. We've got things underway at the middle school as well. We're not minimizing any of those things, and we certainly don't want to stand still in those areas. But we're really trying to put particular focus on the elementary so that we can build a very strong foundation so that our students can go further. Um, as they get into the upper grades as well. But really, you know, what we, what we really want is to establish a culture of doers in the area of STEM. We want children to learn early on that it's about experimentation, it's about making mistakes, that mistakes are good, and that we try again. And, um, and so we really want to instill that aspect of learning in our youngest students so that they'll carry that with them as they go through our school district. To, um, the setup at the Bresnahan, mm -hmm. um, does each classroom get one STEM time a week or it mm -hmm. doesn't work like that? Mm -hmm. Right now, um, grades for, for the fall, grades one through three that it will work that way for grades one through three. And we're trying to figure out how we can integrate some kindergarten into that. The STEM teacher is only a point eight. Mm -hmm. And so right. um, until we're able to make that position a full-time position, we just don't have enough hours in the day. Um, so, uh, but we're, we've got some interesting ideas about how we're going to integrate some STEM work for our kindergarten students too. So our STEM teacher is working very closely with our uh, media library specialist because we're going to be doing some technology integration, of course, in both areas. And um, both our STEM teacher and our media library specialist will be supporting teachers in the ways that they do that. One perhaps with more of a literacy focus, one with more of a STEM focus. So um, we've got some make very exciting work underway there. And they're themed units, so they're themed by, by grade level. Mm -hmm. So if you take a, take a look, um, kindergarten is discovery, Grade one is observation, grade two is investigation, and grade three is problem solving. So grade one only gets to watch. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're gonna learn to be good observers. They don't just get to watch. <laughs> But the thing is that builds then into our themes that we use in fourth and fifth grade. And fourth grade is scientific method and fifth grade is the design process. So you can see how those themes scaffold to and elementary teachers are very comfortable with integrating multiple disciplines into a themed based yeah. study. So that's why we decided to take that approach. Um, for our elementary years. No, this, is, this is incredibly exciting because it really demonstrates for me how you can actually and should uh, teach uh, critical thinking, i.e. problem solving, uh, creative process which includes a lot of observation. Uh, you, you really think about you know collaboration, uh, communication. It's all tied into this. It's it's saying we can and should embrace 21st century skills as early as kindergarten. This is not a high school program when we talk about 21st century skills, and uh, this is very exciting because we're going to be setting up a foundation for very successful students in any subject going forward with this. I think the other thing that, that we're feeling very proud about is in some of the research that Liz and I have been doing, there aren't big um, STEM labs like this in very many elementary schools. Um, you know, they're offering some STEM programming and they're offering some classes, but this is really a, a hub of learning that we're developing. And so we're really excited about that. We actually, in, in uh, researching some of the resources that are out there, we've actually had some publishers say, well, we're just experimenting with putting some elementary STEM resources together. Would you be willing to pilot some of them in this space to see how they work? And so we jumped and we said yes, Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. We've got so, to experiment, we've got that's to observe. Right. That's right, So we're, um, we're, we're, we're very excited about that. I think and, and you know, at the same time, I talked to you in the spring about the fact that we'd be piloting some new science resources for the classroom. So 
you know, ultimately, we really want integrated studies. We don't want this to be an explore that the students leave their teachers for and go. We eventually would like this to be a time where there's co-teaching with the STEM specialist and the classroom teacher. So, um, but we need to get there and we need to bring people along. We need to bring their um, content knowledge along and their comfort level along, much like we did when we first started integrating technology. You know, where they, uh, the teachers uh, need to have someone to go to when they've got questions. They need to be able to watch someone model the practices and, and learn from that and um, co-teach it for a little while. So, so is, it, is it your expectation, your expectation collectively, <clears throat> that the classroom teachers will stay with their students during the STEM work that the STEM teacher will do? Not this year, no. Okay. Because the way this is situated this year is this is during a teacher's planning. So that's where we want to go. Okay, but so right you're, you're going to kind of force the connection then. Force the connection? Well, how? Because they won't be in there, yes, do you mean? Yes, yes. Yeah. I think that... Um, the connection is going to happen pretty organically okay. with the type of resources that they're piloting in their science the class. Same. Exactly. Okay. We're working on the same type of pedagogy in our science classrooms and so or methods of teaching. So we you know, so um, we're we're building that at the same time. I can't imagine a bunch of excited first graders not wanting to go tell the teacher what they just did. Yeah, exactly. No, I understand. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. And that carries over mm -hmm. into all of the other content areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, sure. it's, it's and that's the organic piece that, Angela, is this, this really a natural kind of evolution that, that I think is going to occur. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a, a really fun thing to watch. It will be. So our, our pilot focus with science resources will be on grades three, four, and five this year. As I had explained to you, we um, adopted some new resources in the middle school last year. We're building backwards. We're also looking at some of the resources that our youngest, uh, our teachers of our youngest students have brought forward and asked to explore a little bit, so. It's exciting. It's very exciting. I feel cutting edge. Yeah, good. <laughs> It is good. That's what we want. Thank you. You're Will you uh, periodically update us on this? I would love to. Great. Okay. Next on the agenda is our school committee evaluation discussion. And I'm going to ask you at the end to set a timeline for this uh, conversation as well. So uh, you're all familiar. You, it's, all these documents. Oh, good. Uh, they're in Google Docs, but in speaking to. Um, Mr. DeCanter at length today, uh, we both felt it would be a good idea for people to have hard copies in front of them. Thank you. Just so that we're interpreting the same information. Yeah. And can you, do you have one for Angela too? Thank you, sir. Okay, flipping through, um, it does say um, in this, and I'm sorry about, uh, maybe this one works well, no, the pagination is off, um, and Mrs. Manning worked really hard to try to figure this out, but, um, so I'm not going to be able to refer so much to page numbers on this, because it goes from one to two to three to four back to two, so. Oh, no. Yeah, so she tried to work on that. So, you know, disregard the, the bottom, but as. Okay, so my, this is an old one. Yeah. I got I got it. You, you left it here. Thank you. No wonder you were looking at me like that. It's a good thing I read face language. <laughs> good thing I have a leaky I, face. I, I Sometimes it's like, good. <laughs> I still have another copy of somebody's. Both no, I'm also, I have, I have. Paginated, huh? <laughs> You've heard that word before. No, only oh, only related been, to Congress. Okay. Pagination, right? Yeah, right. Pagination. You didn't learn pagination? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> it just means you know, in order. Um, so if, uh, if you flip over and look at page one, you'll see that our focus is the um, 
these same areas that we are asking the superintendent to um, give us um, information on for uh, her progress. The question that um, that Mr. Hawkeiser brought up last year, I mean last meeting we had, how do we take a look at these goals in terms of the school committee work and not um, other work? So I'm going to, and Mr. DeCant is going to jump in or take over right now, whatever you wish. Uh, uh I think they've raised a very good question. Actually, there were questions that we had raised and there were key parts of our summary that we put together last year. One of the, the issues that we found difficult in doing our self-evaluation was truly understanding what these goals meant uh, and what it was we were evaluating. Um, so initially I had proposed at the last meeting that I put together a little format for us to jot ideas down on. But I think a discussion would be more more productive in asking the same question that I asked the superintendent before. Mm -hmm. As we look at these goals, let's see if we can reach some consensus as to what success looks like. Not whether we did it or not, that's not part of this discussion, nor should it be. Not how well we did it, that's not part of this discussion, or should it be. But only what does success in this goal look like? What are the kinds of things that come to us as we begin to think about these things? So because we have such high-level goals as being the, 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 the ultimate uh, um, supervisors of the whole school district, our goals are very broad. And it can be very difficult. So getting that kind of consensus around what we mean by these things is very important in us being able to put together some kind of a consistent evaluation and we're not going to be able we're not going to be coming back and saying uh, well I think we deserved a three on this and somebody else saying I think we deserved a five on this and when you take a look at it people were talking about two different things in their comments it wasn't they weren't it didn't seem to be evaluating the same the same kinds of things so with that in mind, and, and at David's suggestion, I think what we, what we should do is take a look at exactly what do these goals mean to us. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm a visual person, so I'm going to take advantage of the fact that we have new beautiful technology called a whiteboard over there. And, mm -hmm. uh, we can write on it, right? <laughs> you can write on it. I know I can't write on that one. Yeah. What? <laughs> I was going to say, if we write on that, it goes down in posterity. It's a whiteboard. Yeah. I'm I, not sure either. It's an interactive whiteboard. I think you might need special pens. I'm not positive. Well, I shouldn't say one way or the other. But well, can somebody find me a, a flip chart then, please? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can write, actually write on this whiteboard. I'm not sure. I've never seen anyone do it. I know. All right, let's not do that. Well, okay. let me see if I can find you a flip chart. Let me go to the office, see if I can find him a flip chart. Do we have a projector here I'll that we can it. hook into? No, that's okay. Can, can you start? Yes. Can I ask a basic question up Absolutely. Front? One and two look exactly the same. I don't understand the difference between the sections. What is one and two? I'm sorry? Sections one and two? Yeah. They Actually, look like exactly the same question. They're, they're very similar questions. Um, one talks about whether or not we met them, met the goal, yeah. and the other talks about how well we met the goal. Okay. Okay? So we may have met the goal, but done a pretty sloppy job of it. And so that's what this tries to tease out. It, it does look, um, if you take a look at what we're, what we're looking at, is the, on page one, the way in which we score ourselves is, did not meet some progress, significant progress met or exceeded. That says, you know, how far did we go in the, on the, down the road? Then, you know, did we do the job satisfactorily? Did we need improvement? Are we proficient, which is standard? Are we exemplary? Are we beyond standard? That tells us how well we did the work. Is that, does that help a little bit? A little bit. 
keep going then because this is important. Yeah, no, I just, it, I mean, I and guess. it's a good fresh eye. See, that's what we're kind of looking for, that to make sure everybody understands. Fresh the, eye for the jaded guy, is that what you're saying? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> so please keep going. Yeah, no, I just, looking at this without having gone through an evaluation before, mm -hmm. I would just have equated did not meet with unsatisfactory and you know, needs improvement with some progress, for example. Actually, like it would look exactly the same one thing. of the things that uh, when I'll send the, the instructions around, I probably should have done this already. Uh, normally I, I send a, a, a set of instructions along with the, with the packet that Kathy took uh, One of the things we suggest is that you do the uh, pages three, four, five, and six first, because that, that then these pages are just a summary. It'll become more clear. More clear. The error would be redundant. So, so I'm I'm going to go with what what Christine's asking. And on page one, curriculum and assessment, mm -hmm. um, and then again down at the goals, curriculum and assessment. Yep. So you, I think I'm hearing you say. Page one is the summary of all the work that comes after it. Page one and two both are. Both. So you're just, you're, you're reflecting again, but you're reflecting, um, you know, there's a lot of background information that you can look at. Page one and two are the executive summary of the there you go. report. Essentially. Uh, might be, fill, might that be out that. fill it out last. Right. Could put it in. So why do we need both pages? Because they talk about different things. What? Okay. Page one talks about how far down the path we went. Okay. Let's say we had done a strategic plan that we're absolutely fabulously excited about. The progress was there, etc. But because of if it were a year ago, because of the winter weather. It got delayed by a few months. So we didn't make it down a level of to meeting or exceeding the expectations. So we'd probably say, okay, we made significant prog progress on that. However, we could say the progress we made was exemplary. Seek and you shall find, ask and whatever those things are. Thank you. It's a whiteboard too. There's a whiteboard underneath. Okay, great. <laughs> we didn't want to write on well, that one. Well, you can write on, and you have markers. Okay, grab a couple. Markers, I came prepared. <laughs> okay. Keep going. This is important. I'm liking this. So, um, so it could be that you have an exemplary performance, but you didn't complete the process. Mm -hmm. I think that is more likely to happen than the reverse, which is to say you had you completed the process, but only did a half. An incomplete job of it, or not not with all all your heart and not with all your interest. Oh, you know, you could say, yeah, I got four emails out, but nobody even knew that, or email newsletters out, but nobody read them. Mm -hmm. That could be, yeah, you know what? Compared to what we've done, we exceeded the work, but the quality of the work wasn't such that got us the results we were wanted. So they're not one is quantity, the other is quality. That's what I was. Because that's in your notes, and I think that's an important thing to mm -hmm. to um, reckon with the difference between quantity and quality. Mm -hmm. And that's thank you for that example. Uh, any any other questions or doubts? By the way, this is what I'm reporting back here is my understanding of it, having worked with it a few years, but. Um, I will say two things. Newburyport is light years ahead of every other school district. Mm -hmm. We've been invited to the mass conference to talk about this because we are light years ahead of self on self evaluations. But I am by no means satisfied, or do I believe that this is optimized or perfect? So, any ideas are good ideas. And that's what I'm saying. And clarity is of the utmost because. Um, I think last year, if I'm looking at data correctly here, we scored ourselves as meeting our goals only 
of the scoring opportunities. So I think that's a real um, place for discussion so that, and I'm not talking about getting higher scores, but as Mr. DeCanta said, all of us interpreting these goals the same way. So there isn't that disparity, disparity and it's confusing. Um, and we had a, a case, and I, I don't want to call any names, but I think it was Bruce on one extreme and Steve on the other. And when we got into the discussion, we were basically arguing the same. Right. right. <laughs> you, you sort of said, okay, we didn't do a well enough job of establishing the uh, establishing the understanding, establishing a common understanding of these goals. Do you, do you think that's a, sorry, can I? No, please. Do you think that's it's a open problem discussion. with the evaluation, though, or just the way that the goals are written? For uh, example, like, yes. in my, <laughs> In my field, we do tons of self-evaluations every six months, but our goals are much more, like for example, on our goal two where it says, um, the school committee is charged with consistently listening to processing and responding to family and community feedback, mm -hmm. there would be something much more measurable in, a, in addition to that kind of statement like, mm -hmm. um, you know, 100% of the let's talk yeah. Uh, questions uh, are answered within 48 hours and they're you know what I mean it's easier to kind of evaluate yeah. yourself uh, if you have I a measurable that, that, uh, I think that's a valid comment um, I think we didn't want at least when we put together the goals and Susan you were on the discussion when we did that mm -hmm. I think Bruce you were part of that too. Audrey the and policy and subcommittee at that point too um, was how do we tie into the superintendent, the superintendent's goals as supervisors? Because ultimately, as a board, she's the executive, she's the CEO, she gets the work done. Our job is to facilitate that work and to make sure it happens and that we have the right people in place to make it happen. And so I think, you know, getting down into, into smart goals and getting down into, you know, specific, measurable, uh, yada, 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 all bit, um, makes sense at a much um, more of an executionary or execution level than it does at the supervision level. Mm -hmm. um, so we steered away from it a little bit so we wouldn't limit ourselves that much. Uh, but I think that's where these kinds of discussions today, where we can go back and say, what does this mean to us? So that we're at least all talking about the same thing. Now, as you do your self-evaluation, you can support your evaluation with comments like that. Like, you know, uh, no, we didn't do a good job in communicating with the uh, community at large because let's talk flat on its face. Yeah, that's the kind of comment that we will get and we should get. It supports where you think we came out on these higher level goals. Um, again, we're trying to try it, tie into the superintendent. We also, I'll give you some history on this. We also, what, about four or five years ago, had a very specific uh, school committee self-evaluation. It was something like 92 questions in a questionnaire. <laughs> and uh, when we put it together, it was exactly that level of detail that you're talking about here. We found A, that nobody wanted to get the work done, and B, when we tallied the results, we really did not learn that much. What we're hoping, and what is the biggest part of the learning, is not so much whether we got a proficient or a needs improvement or an exemplary. I think all of us agree that where we really learn is from the comments that all of us have about how our work did the, the uh, the evaluation in terms of thinking, thinking retrospectively about what we've done. That's where the, the, the key learnings were. And that's where I think we've learned a little bit more to work better as a team, to think better about what it is we're trying to achieve. Um, so I would encourage you to use that kind of specificity as you reach your own conclusions. Um, I am not sure that I would want to go back to, uh, because if we did 
smart level goals or just five goals, either we'll be missing a huge part of the picture um, or, or uh, they'll be as empty as not inviting the, the retrospection. I don't think that, that's what we want to do. That's my personal feeling. Bruce and Steve and Cheryl, jump in, please. Well, I'm, I and also, I, you know, I sent all of you, I believe, um, Mr. Hawkeiser's paper, which was three pages. And um, he kind of delineates what he feels are his priorities within each of the goals. Not that um, I'm asking other people to adopt it, but he's got some good good thoughts here. I believe goals ought to be written as outcomes that students experience and benefit from. So those are student-centered, which is what we talk about all the time, and that's what the strategic plan speaks of. I think the goals ought to be referenced during our meetings when we address any of our work. When was the last time we had a goals discussion? I, I, I agree with all of those, and I would say that these comments are particularly pertinent to us as we're beginning to put our goals together for next year, which should start in a program right. with this kind of discussions, with discussions on, on setting priorities. No sooner have we completed the superintendent's evaluation and completed our own self-evaluation that we should say, okay, now it's time to think about going forward. What are we going to put into our next year's plan? Uh, and do that in a way that is educated by the conclusions that we right. reached here. I think they're absolutely good questions. And I, I, would, I would certainly, I don't think, personally, I don't think we should go back and rewrite the goals we set for ourselves. If they're weak, that they have issues, yes. That we can do better, absolutely. But setting uh, goals for ourselves as we're preparing to do our evaluation, I'm not sure would be the most transparent <laughs> processes. No, and I don't want to confuse the two at this point. So mm -hmm. I, I just want to talk about, um, and then we'll move on to priorities. But I just want to make sure everyone's clear, and I appreciate the conversation about page one and page two. Um, page three, curriculum and assessment. Why don't we take a look at, yeah, just for grins, the kinds of things that um, we were asking Susan to do earlier. Uh, goal one, and it says, ensure the district has the direction and resources to meet the community and state expectations and standards. Again, we're not talking about whether we met it or didn't meet it or how we met it, but what does that mean to us? Cheryl, what does it mean to you? Um, that we have clearly articulated where we want to go with this goal. Um, we, I believe we have the resources um, to meet state expectations and standards because that's where we kind of start. What are the mandates from the state? Um, and are those adequate for us? Meeting the needs of our community, to me, is different because our community has higher standards than the state. So I think that's a twofold um, piece as well. Um, the word ensure that the district has directions and resources. I'm real comfortable with ensuring the direction. I'm not sure of all of the resources. Thus, then you can go on to the ta you know the revenue task force and you know. Right, but, but but I think that even even though we can't guarantee the resources, we can identify not having guaranteed the resources, not having gotten the resources yes. as an issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to score big on this and see how how high a score we can get. We're trying to say where where are the areas we can improve on going forward. Right. You know, what, what, what is it that we set out to do? What is it that represents what we were elected to do? And, you know, are we, are we meeting those expectations? I, I, can I just, I sure. just want to add, I think, what Angela presented to us about STEM 
is a perfect example of using the resources to to focus on student needs. Okay, now you're getting into a little bit about whether or not we did it, not necessarily what it means to you. Uh, it was an example. Okay. I'm just call, I'm just trying no, to be, no, no, I'm no. just trying to be very pure in the discussion with I, I, I get you. I get you. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Steve, what does uh, that goal mean to you? We're talking about the one on uh, curriculum page, and assessment. Page three. Yep. Page three. Ensure the district has the direction and resources to meet community and state expectations and standards. Well, I guess part of. Uh, Part of my definition differs, I think, from what you said earlier about the relationship of the school committee with <coughs> the schools. Uh, I'm just going to write down what I see our relationship with, and, it, and it's specific to uh, our role as well as the teacher's contract, okay? Uh, the school committee retains complete responsibility and authority to supervise and control the New Report public school system and the employees thereof including the employees subject to the current teacher's contract, except as limited or modified by the express provisions of that agreement and all applicable laws, including the collective bargaining sections in 150E of the general laws of Massachusetts. So I think that's where we find ourselves. So I think given that scope, if you will, uh, I think it is important to define and here, and it's one of the reasons why we have a bargaining team working on this contract, because I think in a lot of ways uh, that contract drives a lot of the things that we try to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's important to uh, take a look at what we're trying to achieve in a contract from both sides. And I also think it's important to properly resource that so that we can look ahead. We can look ahead toward setting high standards as Ms. Sweeney said uh, we're trying to get above what the state expects and we're really trying to meet what uh, and we've had brief discussions about this in, in at our retreat we're trying to recognize that the fact that uh, parents are preparing their children for for big things in the report and we we collectively uh, school committee school administration teaching support staff have to try to meet those things so uh, so I I guess I'm focusing in on you know what's driving the direction and again strategic plan is a big piece of that too but ultimately it's going to be the resources that in the contract that uh, sends us in the direction that we want to go. So part of the, the view of success that you would have in this element would be a strong workable contract that works for both sides of the table uh, that is uh, ultimately that unifies our greater school community. Because I know, and I'm not trying to take anything away from the superintendent, because the superintendent is in charge, but we, as an elected body, have that authority mm -hmm. and control. Yeah, I think that's, that's very, good. very good. So a contract that unifies the school community is an important part. And knowing where we're going, a strategic plan. Bruce? Um, there were elements of this that sort of stood out to me, and, and um, one was ensuring that the district has the direction, and that was where I sort of focused. And, you know, um, knowing where we're headed, knowing what sort of the big picture is, knowing what the goal or the outcomes that we're looking for, I think is really important. That's part of direction for me. And sometimes one of the things that we've struggled with over the years is that there's a, a sense, whether it's an accurate perception or not, there's a perception that we're moving in multiple directions at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, so so for me, when I'm looking at looking at at, at that direction, how um, you know, use the term that, that Steve used, 
how, how unified is that direction? How consolidated is that direction? Um, is, is, it, is it consolidated to the point where we're all able to put our energy into it, understanding that that's what we're doing? Um, and that touches, I think, on the strategic plan. I think that touches on the contract. That touches on, on you know, our, our whole approach to curriculum. That touches on, on how we're um, bringing resources like, like NEF into the schools. Mm -hmm. You know, what's, what is that direction telling us? So that was the word that sort of jumped out at me um, in this particular goal. And, and the community expectations piece is, is, a little bit, is a little bit looser because we've got, you know, we have a, 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 we often have around particular issues a very engaged community. And around some issues we don't have very much engagement at all in the community. Mm -hmm. In, in encouraging us to adopt certain ideas, mm -hmm. so um, so I, that's that's sort of where I focus on. Okay. Christine, um, yeah, I guess I'm just I'm also kind of stuck on the community expectations portion of this in terms of. Um, You know, who, who, what part of the community are we really surveying in terms of their expectations? And I'm thinking, I'm playing devil's advocate here because I'm, I'm totally, I, you know, I'm a scientist. I love STEM. STEM is like my thing. But if we have a donor, for example, who wants STEM in the school, are we, are we valuing their community expectations over? community members who don't have the resources to kind of add something to our curriculum. I'm thinking, and I just don't know how some of this works, um, but like for example with the NEF and their support of STEM, are we, are we really the ones going to NEF and saying, you know, this is where we want to focus our resources versus and so in that case, how, since there's been such a huge public outcry for foreign language, like how did we end up with STEM instead of foreign language in that spot? And I'm just, I'm curious. I don't know the answer. I think it's a very good question. It's a very good mm -hmm. question. Uh, uh, there are two, two things that are in place here. Uh, both Angela and uh, the superintendent sit on the NEF allocations committee precisely to guide them in deciding how to spend the money they raise or what our priorities are to be raised. Secondly, there's a policy which we will stumble upon once we get through all the other policy work we're doing, uh, which talks about donations and uh, how the school can accept donations or the school district can accept donations and whose responsibility it is for defining how that money is used. And that lies at the district level, firmly in the hands of the superintendent, at the school level, firmly in the hands of the principal. So the, these are things that are in place there. And uh, I think it's a, it's a very good question because people need to understand that. We don't go and say, oh, you know, Google just came and they're offering this whole bunch of new technology. Well, maybe we'll take it if technology happens to be part of our priorities. But if it, at the same token we say, hey, Coke wants to put in free vending machines and, and uh, offer free sugary drinks for all our, our kids, we'd probably say, eh, it's a nice offer. You know, it might help us uh, keep people in the cafeteria, but it's not in line with our well wellness policy. No, we don't accept that. So there, there are guidelines in there for accepting these goods, and it's important that we understand them. Mm -hmm. But in terms of drawing, driving the major initiatives, that starts uh, with the schools and it goes to the NEF. Okay. You raise a very valid question, though, and that is for Angela and the superintendent, perhaps, to answer is, you know, 
why does it make sense for us to go after STEM right now and not after foreign language? Oh, and I don't, so I don't want to have question. anyone misunderstand because, you know, I, I love science. <laughs> it's not that. You're it's not that I wouldn't want it. I'm just, I'm trying to get my head around how... how and I know you're also a languages person, so there you go. Yeah. I mean, I'll take anything. <laughs> and if I can just add to that, you know, you know, part of it are guidelines around our foundation, um, the kinds of things that they... Um, their parameters allow them to fund and so much of foreign language is about personnel and so that's one of the reasons that you know the things primarily that they're doing for us around STEM are buying the tools uh, that are needed to do that yeah. it's a very rare occasion that they may help us bridge a part of a salary to get mm -hmm. us to the next point that may happen but generally speaking they really look to the school district for the school district to be able to pay the salaries of your personnel and do the kind of things that the city should be paying for. And the NEF sees themselves as that philanthropy arm to do the kind of things that you just would never be able to get into a regular budget. So just just add some more context to that. But, but to add to that as well, I'm sorry, <laughs> I don't mean to interrupt you, but you know, you're our representative on CPAC, mm -hmm. and so that's a that's a, 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 a piece of the community that we obviously value, and we want to hear about that. So, um, one of the questions was, who's our audience? Who do, who 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 are we looking to communicate with? Who's making the decisions? Yeah. Um, I feel real comfortable that we're making the decisions, and if it ever gets to the point where we're not, I think there are enough scaffolds in place. Um, you know, the members of this committee who are on NEF, and you know, you, there's an allocations committee that meets once a month, or is it once a month? Mm -hmm. So they're not going off on a tangent, you know, but um, period. I think. I think there's there's a question here, and this and this particular goal that uh, we probably need to ask ourselves, and that really is, who is the community? We're saying community standards. That's. And you know, we've got community again. Bruce brings it up in terms of communications. Um, we are charged with representing, really, the people that don't have. Uh, that don't have any say in, in electing us. You're charged with representing the students in our schools. First and foremost, and we always talk about student achievement being the core of it. And so when we talk about community standards, probably if you go painting concentric circles around that core of the students, the next circle around those students is teachers on one side and parents on the other, because they both have direct contact with the students. Then you have the family members of those, then you have the people who have had kids, been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. And then you have the people that just moved into town and they have no idea what kids are about. They, they put either post or pre-engaged uh, population. <coughs> so they're, they're various levels and in a way they all form part of the community and our challenge is how do we listen to that, balance it appropriately and turn it into these kinds of actions. I think um, that's a perfect segue because now you're talking really about number two. So I, I really think. Um, Are you trying to keep me going here? Yes. Um, I'm wasting your dollar? No, you're not. <laughs> number two, you, it was a natural segue. Families and communities, as representatives of families and communities in the district, the school committee is charged with consistently listening to, processing, and responding to family and community feedback. So what does this mean to me? We are representing a constituency out there. We are representing um, students um, who we want to do the best job we can. This one comes up for me every year. We, we don't seem to um, be satisfied with the communication loop and under my you know my evidence I, I would talk about things like how we switched we changed um, 
you know, public comment, how we've um, tried um, Let's Talk. We've talked about a <laughs> newsletter. We've talked, we now have a presence on Facebook. So those are some of the things that I think, in my mind, we have worked on this year to improve that particular um, goal. But what does what does it what what does success of this goal look like to you, Cheryl? Um, that it's hard because mm -hmm. I guess um, the part that's that's difficult. I I think we do a good job of. Um, we're not evaluating them. No. Consistently um, listening to how we process information, how, oh, okay. we've, how we get back to people on decisions we've made. Um, you know, we only hear from a small microcosm at public comment, but sometimes if you put some of the other things together, like what's happening in Facebook and social media and all of that, you get a, a, another idea of another group of people. Um, so, it, this is, I'm going to say, this is a tough one for me. Yeah, it's a tough uh, there, um, One of these are easy. No, but, uh, so I'm having a little trouble articulating, so I'm going to uh, let you move on. You Mr. Coles will be articulating better. <laughs> I think I think because I'm I'm on the school committee and I am a family in the school it, it is it is really difficult I, I think that most families in the school don't have a real relationship with the school committee unless there's a problem and I so what would success in this goal look like to you Having lots of people with lots of problems, so they communicate with us. No. <laughs> Hearing some good news every once in a while. <laughs> Bruce? Um, oh, I'm sorry, Christine, you have any? I'll come back to you. Oh, no, I just, I think that, the, I do think that the, the, the part where it talks about processing and responding to family and community feedback is um, success in that, I think, to me, I don't always I don't always know what the response is to families that are giving us feedback, and I, I'd like to see success would look like everyone knowing what the response was and and how the issue was resolved and the communication communication yeah that's a good point. Well, I mean, I would, I would I'm sure. evaluating. Sorry, it's it's not communication. It's dialogue. Well, but but it's it's back and forth. Exactly. You know that. I mean, this one is this one is sort of near and dear to my heart, and has probably been um, both a driver for all of these years for me, and a point of frustration. You know, because I, I don't, you know, without sort of evaluating. I mean, there are some very clear, tangible measures. You know. You know, do you know? And one of these measures is is all the empty seats that we consistently see now, and we didn't see that for a while. There was there was a period of time when a lot of people were coming, not not necessarily because they had issues, but because they wanted to see what the process was about. They wanted to see what we were doing. Um, we don't see that many people coming to our meetings anymore, um, and that to me, you know, and that's not because people are really happy with the way things are going. That's I think because they don't really feel engaged. They don't really feel um, part of this process. Um, you know, we don't have, you know, do we, what's the degree to which we have conversation around budget? How, how are we encouraging conversation around budget? Um, or are we just informing people about, about the budget? Um, so, so there's really, this is really to me where the rubber hits the road with the community, where there's a, where, you know, there's a lot more give and take. Um, you know, how are we listening and how are we demonstrating that we're listening? You know, what's, the, what's, what's an outcome that shows that we've heard what people are saying? So, so success would, would be? Success, success would be um, community, you know, co would be community engaged here in the issues, giving us, you know, feedback that's both constructive feedback and feedback that's both critical, that's also challenging and critical feedback. 
but it would be it would be people being awake, alive, and engaged in, in, in what we're doing. And I think you, you measure that again by by people showing up, by people. Being well, that's, yeah, that's one. I, I think I, I think of my the amount of time I spend on school committee stuff outside of these meetings and just people coming up to me in the sidelines of the, of the soccer field or mm -hmm. uh, in the aisles of Market Basket or whatever. And they have very valuable, wonderful insights. And I, all of that communication, I'm not sure that we are uh, being consistent with our response. And I'm not sure we're closing the feedback loop so that people know that we're getting back to people. Is it really a dialogue if they're talking only to one? Right. So I get like your it, point. Like it, like it or not, like it or not, the conversation has moved out of this room and into social media. Mm -hmm. And as long as we keep social media at arm's length, we are we are losing the battle for 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 engaging the community. Mm -hmm. And that's just that's just the reality of it. You know, you can hate Facebook. But that's where the conversation is taking place now. The conversation that used to take place in here is now taking place there. And the advantage to that conversation is that at any given point, 8,000 people can participate in that conversation. The, I think the thing you need to be careful of, though, is that you have to speak as one voice. Right. And that's the, that's right. the, diff that's right. the challenge. Right. We've, been talking, about, but we've been talking about that being the challenge and really haven't had much conversations about how to do that for years. Another comment that I think that you brought up, Bruce, that I just want to I want to offer an observation. You know, if you recall when we did the the budget discussion in January this year, and we had Nick, you were facilitating a lot of that, and we had post-it notes up there, and we were getting feedback from people. Mm -hmm. um, I think you really had some great engagement that night. I think you had a lot of people who were involved that night who really came forward with what they wanted to see and were pretty honest about that. But I think that one of the things that helped with that is that it was that communication piece again, is that we advertised that, we put that out there. And we did have more people come to that, so. We, we did have them come, but then what happened with the information we collected? Still really nothing. So again, now yeah. here we got some points so that we can consider as we go back, and if you, think that nothing happened, you might be saying, you know, I'm critical of our of our feedback loop. And that gives us a direction for improving something. Exactly. Next year. So we're not trying to evaluate right now. We're just trying to say, what does it look like? And, uh, and see where we come out. Steve? Uh, just a couple of things. I like what Bruce said about things moving into social media. I think that's, that's a fact. Uh, but I guess I just want to remind people of... Uh, one thing, or a couple things. First one is that uh, school events in Newburyport draw a lot of families. Okay, it, it's rare if uh, you have if you go to a school event, it's rare that if you don't show up 15 minutes before that event, you're going to be able to find a parking space near the school. So the fact of the matter is, parents, families are engaging our schools in, in that way. Uh, Parents and families are also supporting schools through paying fees that over the course of a school year accumulate to what someone, some may call an additional tax. But people are paying the freight for their kids. Uh, and I think you have to look at those items and, and think, okay, so if people are supporting schools through going to school events, if people are paying out of their pocket for various fees, supporting dough sales, pie sales, whatever. Uh, what's gonna then make them feel like they have to come here? I think, I think for specific issues, you have people that'll come here, but I think overall, I think families are engaged in supporting their kids and I don't know, maybe there's something creative we can do about getting involved with school events. Uh, it, just, it just strikes me that the events in this city schools are very, very well attended. And should we be have more visibility at those somehow? Uh, but also, you know, people focus to go there to see how the kids are doing, to, to see if there's a presentation, to see the presentation, if there's teachers to meet with, the teachers to meet with. But it just strikes me that uh, unless we have something really compelling here, we're not going to get the people here. 
back in 06 when we were talking about closing down to Kelly School, it was no problem to get this room filled with people or the cafe filled with people. But, uh, and hopefully, you know, we don't get to those points like then, like we did then. You know, we're, we're, at, a, we're at a good point now. I don't want to say that all of our schools have state-of-the-art facilities, but they're pretty close. They're pretty close and we're adding things. And, you know, we of course want more. We of course want more. We want the best learning infrastructure for the children and students of our schools, the, the, the folks that Nick said, have said don't have that voting privilege. So, uh, I mean, I think, I think if we can get creative on being able to increase our outreach and go where the parents are, you know, I mean, we got some very dedicated people here. Um, I was talking to Dawn a little on the way in. I thank them for being here. Uh, and, uh, you know, but uh, in summertime, but I think once school year rolls out, I think if we think of a way to better engage and maybe it's going to an event and maybe it's saying a few words and inviting people, but, uh, and again, engaging social media more effectively and safely, I think those are two good areas. So here are some thoughts that you might consider when you're evaluating the school committee on this particular issue. Okay, and how are we doing it? Okay, point number three. Professional culture with the superintendent set direction for and model the professional behavior we expect our faculty and staff to follow. I get to stop. <laughs> Beautiful. He's, he's rotating. Okay. I love it. That's all right. We don't hear him from you, though. That's all right. And teacher, and you, the, you always he, want to jump around and call on different kids. Keep go. everybody engaged. Yeah. There you go. He's the compiler. There you okay. go. The compiler. <laughs> the, the, the compiler and the paginator. How's that? Oh, huh? <laughs> Using those words. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Professional culture. Well, I think. Uh, I think in short, there's a couple things that, that drive this, and one of the key ones is that initial message to staff on the first day. Uh, that kind of sets the direction for the school year. It kind of uh, builds upon a recognition of completing the prior year, recognizing that people uh, have a good summer, rested up and ready to go, and then you basically set set the tone or set the direction for the for the next year and again i think uh con contractually with the help of the contract a lot of things can be built in to professional culture because you're listening to what teachers feel they need to do their job via the contract so i guess those are the the thing the the, the two i guess functional pieces and of course, those involve some resources, whether it be time, professional development, you know, money to support the contract. And then the other piece is feedback or a feedback loop that, and well, and then of course, f feedback loop from, from parents, but also uh, continued uh, implementation and review of the evaluation system, which, you know, we're just in the first few years of that. So I think- Are, are we looking, I'm sorry, I, yeah. I, I, thought, I heard you going in one direction. I just want to make sure that well, we're back. No, 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 I, 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 I guess I put the evaluative stuff, the teachers, the new teacher evaluation, which, you know, is a few years old now, but I, I put the new teacher evaluation first and then perhaps, uh, Feedback that we get from parents, families, even students. How about feedback as a, from teachers? As a piece and of that, what's that? Feedback from teachers and staff. Yeah, that that too. Yeah. That's what. That's where I thought you were going. That's right. Well, I'm just you so know. I'm bring, you see, I'm jumping in with one of my own Good. ideas. See? If it's yeah. not yours, Steve, I'm going to claim it. That's right. You can <laughs> take it. Don't say after you take it. Biggie bag. Okay. Cheryl. What? Um, what? What's it got? 
What's it got for me? For, for me, um, and I'd like to, it's a, it's a question for all of us. How do we model professional behavior? And is that what this says? It says, would the superintendent set direction for and model the professional behavior that we expect our faculty and students to follow? So how do I do that? And I'm going to go back to maybe what Mr. Cole was talking about, because I absolutely agree um, that the school committee business isn't always done in this room. It's done at school events and on social media and other places. So how do we model that behavior um, and tie it to the superintendent and set a direction for it? Well, I, I, you know? I think one way is to respond quickly because if you, if you get information, you know, you just described a different thing, whether it be going to events, it becomes some type of listening post. If you get information and you respond to it as, as a group with that, trying to, you know, achieve that single voice, you show the community that you're an action-oriented group. Mm -hmm. If you don't respond, then you're not being a a action oriented, and you're not going to get you're not going to get the respect I think of people who want you to be doing things. So, uh, I think being responsive, taking action when information comes up, meeting to talk about what the best way to approach it would be, and, and again, go back to Bruce's point. Maybe social media is the best way to get that message out. You know. How do we do that? How do we do that and do it clearly? And make sure it doesn't get twisted, you know, because that's the other part of it. Sometimes your message can go out there and get twisted, and uh, you have to have a way to correct it. And see, that's the other thing. I think there are many this year Facebook pages that are popping up. There's optimizing learning. There's early times, early start times. There's our school committee page, and I think part of this is that we maintain our decorum on those websites as well sort of a, you know, a, a set of etiquette rules for ourselves, you know, how do we respond to, uh, you know, a Facebook comment or, you know, as Susan said, we need to speak as one voice. We, I don't believe it reflects professional behavior if you're sending a message and I'm sending a different one. Mm -hmm. And then Bruce gets on and says something different. So. Um, you know that's part of our core values and ethics and I guess mm -hmm. that's what I'm getting at well, I so, think that so we're, we're looking about uh, responding quickly and consistently with that consistently but also to me part of the consistency is making sure that we're identifying that what we're saying may not reflect the entire school committee but reflects my thinking on this particular subject and and there is that disclaimer at the bottom of you know whatever we do send out that either you're speaking you know as a representative of the school committee or you know on your own and I think that's an important distinction as well and that's professionalism <coughs> How about, oh, I've got an idea to see if Christine comes up with first <laughs> oh, <gee, Chris. laughs> it's no pressure um Yeah, I guess I, I, I can add to the list of things that I think would help model professional behavior, like being transparent in our communications. But I don't even, I guess I'm not even sure if we're there yet or if we need to identify what professional behaviors we all, I mean, it's entirely possible that that's you know, that that's what I'm thinking and yeah. the whole group I mean, is you know, not. It's okay if we're not there yet. That's the whole purpose of this evaluation right. is to, to determine how close to there we are. But if we don't know where we're going, we don't know if we're anywhere near there or we're heading the wrong direction. Well, or, or if, in fact, we're pulling in different directions. Yeah. So I like transparent, taking action, responding consistently. And and being the collaborative. You said you had a few of them. Well, collaboration. Being collaborative. Uh -huh. mm, that's a good point. Clipper values. Clipper values. Oh. I, I, I'd like to think of the, the, the days when I was back in kindergarten or maybe first grade. 
and what, that was when somebody first started telling me, do your homework. Uh, be prepared, do your homework. Uh, I think is a key part of the professional. Um, professional behavior. Do we want to be a Boy Scout and say be prepared, or do we, do we want to say do your homework and be school people? <laughs> I don't think being prepared is perfect. I started to be prepared, so that's what we'll stick with. Way to go, BSA. Okay. Any other thoughts on professional culture? So, okay, we've got, we covered the modeling. Uh, I think these are all things that we could reasonably expect our teachers and staff to do. Uh, what? Can I just clarify a piece, though? Yeah. Um, and somebody hopefully will address this. Would the superintendent set direction for and model professional behavior? Um, I guess, Susan, I'm going to ask you, what do you expect from us in that? That, um, for me, that you, that the discussions, the transparency that's being talked about happens here at the table, mm -hmm. but once a vote is taken, that we act as one. Good point. Good point. So we reach consensus, or, well, maybe not, but we at least you can make a decision and that's we, decision we go with it, whether, you know. That's maintaining the integrity, I think. And the other thing that, from my perspective, is that the school committee can say to me, all right, Susan, here we have 10 goals we want you to work on this coming year. We would never do that to you. And, <laughs> and you know, and I would come back and say, that's not going to work because okay. we already have, and, and being able to have that kind of a conversation with the school committee to respectfully disagree and vice versa. If there's something that, that the school committee is really passionate about and I'm pushing back on it, but you keep coming back to it as a group, then I, you know it's my, it's my job to say, all right, well, I, I, I have to shift my thinking, paradigm shift here. And I really have to listen for a little while and hear why this is so important to them. You know, what are they hearing out in the community that perhaps I'm not? So respect, I think, is a big word up there. Um, we respect each other whether we're listening or we're responding or we're uh, bringing up a concept. Um, yeah. The other, the other thing that I would say that I don't think that we've done enough of as a group, we've done a little bit of it, is professional development for the group. Mm -hmm. That includes the school committee, superintendent, assistant mm -hmm. superintendent. And, and really talk about perhaps some of those listening behaviors that we want to see. And those communication behaviors that we want to have amongst each other. Right. I would agree with that very strongly. You know, I think that how we communicate with each other and because so because so much of what we do is public here, mm -hmm. how we're communicating to the community, understanding that, that we're not just, um, you know, I'm not just talking to Steve here, I'm, I'm talking so that the entire community hears what I have to say. Mm -hmm. um, and, I don't, and I don't think we keep that in mind enough. I mean, I have, you know, I, I have my evidence of areas in which I think that we have some problems, and that's not what we're here to discuss. Yeah. But, um, but that's going into my evaluation. Mm -hmm. you know, specific areas in which I think that we've been inconsistent, where we, we have not moved professional in professional ways, um, and and there are evidence. There's also evidence that, of stuff that we've done really well and effectively. Okay. We on to four. Four. Teaching all students. Um, it says ensure the new report public schools offer a comprehensive program that meets varying student needs from children with disabilities to gifted. 
What does that look like? If we said we're rocking this, what would be happening at the breast head, at the breast? Well, sorry, what would be happening the breast, but I know what would be happening in general. That that opportunities that kids would have, all, all kids would have opportunities. For example, you know, an, an example to me is whether or not we open AP to all students, or we just keep AP to certain students. Mm -hmm. you know, that would be an example of teaching all students, of giving every kid the opportunity to succeed. Um, and and that requires, I think, some innovative thinking. It requires mm -hmm. some changes in how we've looked at certain things. We have to let go of certain things. You know? And it would also look like the flip side of that, having some of our 18 to 22 year olds um, attending classes on a college campus. Mm -hmm. It would look like that too. Because mm -hmm. that's when you're 18 to 22, that's where you're supposed to be. And also, group. I think it looks like all children feel challenged to the best of their ability. Um, I think uh, examples of that are, are, you know, our reading program where you read at your level and your success is measured by your growth. Um, we had conversation recently about um, perhaps a gifted second grade math student being able to attend third grade math classes. Um, so I, I, this is into the future, but I think the reimagining teaching and learning, um, if that happens, I, I think then we will be successful for this goal, with this goal. I think at the moment, and somebody can correct me, um, I, I think we're doing an outstanding job with our uh, children with disabilities. I'm not sure about the whole other end of the spectrum, gifted, and what we're offering them, and what opportunities they can have within the current structure. And for me, that's not that's not there yet. You so know, I want to repeat a comment that I've made that I've made since I came here. That one of the draws for me in coming here was the fact that you had, that this high school had flex classes, right. and that you were offering different kinds of learning opportunities for students in the evening. And, and we've played around with that a little bit over the last four years. You know, we've had some teachers come in a little bit later and stay later. We've had some teachers who have, you know, worked in the, some evenings. We've, you know, so we've really, we've tried to, to see what that can look like. And I think that we'll continue to push that envelope. And I think that that is, while it's not necessarily teaching all students, it is, looking at the best ways that students learn. I think that, that you know, we talked, we talked earlier today, Mr. Iannini was here, about the needs of rethinking the high school schedule. And I think, you know, in general, we spent a lot of our time discussing financial resources. I don't think we spend nearly as much time as that discussing the key resource that we have with our kids, and that's time. Uh, you know, do we have kids at the middle school for enough time? Do we have kids at the high school for too much time? Uh, you know, what is, how are we adequately using that resource? Because that's a resource, A, we don't have to go to the community to get, and B, if we don't use it, we've lost it forever. So uh, to me, is use of time is one of the things that I, I think about in terms of reaching all students and engaging all students. And what I probably would add to, to all students feel challenged. All students feel engaged is probably the word that I would look for. But this is a consensus building or discussion, so whatever. It doesn't have to I, be I just was other. talking about reaching reaching potential mm -hmm. and having an avenue to do that. But from Susan's comment back to Steve's, I think um, that collaboration with the contract and how we get teachers to teach outside the standard school day is um, a, a reflection of really good practice and, and opening things up. And if I'm not mistaken, some of those opportunities were brought um, by teachers. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's 
one of the things that I think is really um, strong about this district that you know teachers have a place to go if they want to try something um, you know there's a lot of risk in teaching and uh, we have to encourage that in our teachers and in our students so uh, success for me would be that um, we offer a comprehensive program um, I think we have pockets of programs I'm not sure uh, we have a comprehensive program we, we do with our special education population again but um, perhaps we're not meeting the needs of everyone and some of that's budget some of that's space some of it's time some of it may be beyond our control Um, I think that a piece of this sort of overlaps uh, in, in ways that make sense with the first goal of my curriculum. And that is, it sort of goes back to me to that question that I just have not, those questions I have not been able to get out of my head that Dave Hockheiser has raised about what do we know about our students? How do we know what we know? And then what are we doing with that? What are we doing with that? And, and that's, that's a, an ongoing conversation. That's a conversation, I think, for the curriculum subcommittee to have and for all of us to have. But that really folds into this as, as easily for me as it does with the curriculum. How do we, how do we know what, what our students are about, what, what, they're, what they're lacking, and what, what they have in overabundance? So and then, a success would be, uh, a success indication would be proper utilization of tools to capture data capture data capture student needs desires uh, and then using that information to design that gets to student voice too I think mm -hmm. what do I what do I need how can I get it what are my options no. Yeah, I mean, I, I've had, on three occasions since I've been here as superintendent, I've had students who have contacted me and want to meet with me on particular topics. And I, you know, I love that. I absolutely love it. And I think that it, it says something about a district where students feel comfortable. Yeah approaching the superintendent or approaching the principal and saying we'd like to talk to the superintendent and I, I think that you know that's part of the that gets back to the culture piece that we want to set and that we want to roll on and it, I, to piggyback on that um, I think our options for dual enrollment and college um, um, opportunities is something that we want to continue to pursue vigorously because if we can't do it ourselves, we should be able to provide some kind of an avenue for students to pursue, so. Okay. I've got 10 minutes before Cheryl grabs the... No, you don't have 10. You've got five. Number five, management and operations. Let me just give you one more for oh, four. Sure. Let me give you one more for four. No, 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 it's all right. Uh, and this is kind of a... Uh, it's a it's a little subjective, but I, I think everyone will appreciate it. So kind of building together what everybody's saying. Uh, if we had a comprehensive program that met varying, varying student needs, I guess one of the things that I would strive for, and again, it's kind of a subjective and narrative result, but that every year and every grade is made memorable in a positive way for each student. Uh, I just think that's something if you have a way to meet the students' needs, if mm -hmm. kids are engaging. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's a student that engages the superintendent about an issue, right. I guarantee you that's going to be one of the memorable things that student had for that year. So I, I think if there's a way, and, and, you know, if we make every year it's memorable, because, you know, I mean, I can think back to my own experience. I had some years that i rather forget, <laughs> maybe in the second and third grade. Did your teachers feel that way, too? Yeah, one of them that kept me after school, I did. But, uh, but you know, I mean, uh, if, if there's a way that every year can be memorable, 
I think that's that's something. And, and, you know, and I think if we can, and I think that's something you can use to join a community in too. You know? That'd be a good. That's a great reflection moment, really. You know, maybe the student says it and the parents say yeah. it. Both and you know, and like then that. it also brings to mind if it's not, if people are noticing the students maybe not having a memorable year. You what get, can we do you to get make that kid supports? Yep. You know. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Number five, the last one. Like it. <gasps> All right, we've got two people who have left the room already. No, we have. We're gonna take these. Oh. 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 I'm gonna call people. Okay. Because Mr. DeCanter needs them back, too. I do. Take pictures on your phone. That's all right. Don't worry about it. We've already done that one. Okay, number five. And number five is management and operations. And it says... Uh, ensure the city provides the district with the resources, financial, personnel, facilities, and supplies it needs to deliver on state and community standards and expectations. So we've already talked about community standards and expectations, so I don't necessarily want to go back to that unless people have a different take on it for this particular bullet. No, I just think that there's a strong link between number one and number five. And number two and number five and number three. Well, and number five. but this specifically talks about you know um, ensuring that that the district has the resources, and I think you know for this one we we're all sitting in this room knowing that uh, we don't have enough money for our budget. You know, there's that that uh, phantom 1.5 million dollars that was lost and hasn't been recouped. I'm not saying that the money needs to be recouped in the same way we used to spend it because I think things have changed, but success for me in this standard would be that we were able to do um, the things we value as important for our students and that we have a clear vision of what that is and that we all work toward that same sort of, I mean, if you talk about facilities, we have, you know, a beautiful new school, a renovated school. Um, we've got, you know, beautiful new technology in those, those schools. And, um, but it, is it enough? No, because we're always looking for more. Well, there's that dichotomy between what the schools look like and what's going on inside the schools. And we've really focused for the last number of years on, on what the schools look like. You know, what, what kind of facilities do we have? And, you know, I think the message is loud and clear from the community that, that we need to now be focusing on what's happening in the schools. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bruce, would you add to this? Second. I had another point, you know. So being able to do those things that we value. So if we value foreign languages, are we able to do them? If we value robotics, are we able to do them? If we evaluate or value varsity tiddlywinks, do we have a varsity tiddlywinks program? Is that? Yes. The gist? Okay. Maybe not the tiddlywinks, but. Oh, come on. <laughs> That's in STEM, right? <laughs> it is. Yes. Lots of physics. <laughs> I have Bruce? No. Christine? I guess when I'm reading this, and I don't know what the intent was when it was written, I have I know we can't change our goals, but I don't love this ensure the city provides, because I don't think we can ensure that they, they do anything. So... When I'm reading it, I'm looking at this more as, are we <coughs> making a strong case for what we need from the city? Are we being collaborative with them on what kind of um, resources they can provide, <coughs> um, rather than 
whether what the outcome is in terms of being able so if I'm hearing this I'm just trying to shorten it a little bit um, are we communicating the value yeah to our community I think to that's fair. support the value of our mm. Mrs. Kennedy, can you read my handwriting? No, that was my problem. I uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I think it was my old eyes. Who are linked really closely together if you if you read them again. You know, communicating the value and then um, being able to do the things we value. I think you're right I, with the community. I mean, the communication. Steve, what does the finance committee have to say? Uh, <laughs> well, my uh, my kind of view on this. Uh, and it stems from my uh, studying quality a number of years ago. Uh, my view on this is I really see this as really operational effectiveness of the schools, using your personnel, your facilities, your supplies, your fiscal resources. Uh, I think it's vital to having a quality school district and it's part of what I see as a palm print for quality, okay? which include safe schools, high student achievement, recruiting and retaining your best staff, operational effectiveness of schools, and making sure as much of every tax dollar or as many, much of every educational dollar makes it into the classroom. So mm. one of my pieces of that, as I've learned, is the operational effectiveness piece. And again, we're, we're in decent shape with that now. We weren't, you know, back in the days when we are voting to close the Kelly School and reorganizing and doing all that stuff. <coughs> we weren't in the best shape. We are much better. I mean, and uh, I just think that's how I look at it. Just finding ways to make sure we're, uh, we're not wasting resources. We're getting the best bang for our buck. Uh, it was a big item in the action team that I worked on tried to find different things that we could try to save money on and then plow that money back into uh, the school district. So again, operational effectiveness, that's how I look at this item. Uh, the other thing I, I want you to capture from what Steve said is um, uh, we maximize the dollars going right back into the classroom. Because that's directly to the students, and right. I think it's important to the capture students that and instruction and part of those. Right. Yeah. What were the other two things you said oh, then? Safe schools. Okay. That's for everybody. Highest student achievement. Recruiting yep. and retaining your best staff. Yep. Operational effectiveness of schools, school buildings, and making sure as much of every educational dollar makes it into the classroom. A palm print of quality. I, I, and you're making me with pagination. I'm like, okay. <laughs> a palm print five. Oh, for, yeah. Wow. I think. Uh, does anybody else have a comment about? What you said, uh, Steve's comments about operational effectiveness just rem remind me of my own past when I used to run um, group homes uh, for people with um, mental health issues. Um, when the Committee on Accreditation and Rehab Facilities came in to give us our accreditation so that we could continue to contract with the state, um, they had this concept called model coherency. And model coherency is it's a very simple concept. We have the right staff, we have the right things, and the right students, the right time, and in the right place, and in the right way. And if you ha are banging on all of those things, those six things. He's got six. Um, is six, <laughs> but but if you if you're doing all of those things and your model is coherent and it's going to be really effective and it's going to hum and it's really going to make a difference in, in everybody's life, um, and that's really what operational effectiveness is. 
you know, you have the right, you know, you have the right resources in the right way, with the right consumers, with the right staff, the right facilities, you know what you're doing. So that that word operational, I think, is is key. It yeah. could mean just uh, facilities, or it could mean you it's know, how they all come together. The package. How they all come together. The way in which yeah. we've we've talked about it here, and that's why we're discussing it, right. is the appropriate use of resources to meet our goals. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask Christine, since she's the neophyte on the team. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Is this discussion being helpful in defining what these things mean and how you might evaluate the school committee on it? It is helpful. Um, I think it would also have been helpful to have gone to to have watched the goal setting process. Yeah. And to be honest with you, you didn't blink and miss it. We didn't do as much of it as we should have. And I think one of the things that Cheryl and I were talking about as we go forward into the next set of goals is really building upon what we learned from this and having the same kind of discussion, not as we prepare to do our evaluations, but as we're setting our goals. So when we say something like whatever the, the, the verbiage is there, we understand what we mean by that. Mm -hmm. And also I think Mr. Hawkeiser's not here, but one of his points was um, to have kind of, uh, you know, set periods during the year when when we go back and we talk about the progress and we talk about what the goals are so that it isn't you know we're doing this now we're doing our evaluation and then we don't visit it again until next year when our evaluation is due I think we it need that needs to be an ongoing process as well like the superintendent evaluation is that's ongoing that it doesn't stop and we talk about so thank you very much mr. decanter Thank you and everyone question. else for your so I, so one thing that brings to mind Cheryl that mm -hmm. I think we should put on the next agenda is to take a look at the calendar that the school committee has set month right. by month as a yeah. group and see if there are things that need to be moved because I think you're going to find that there are some things that need to be moved and I think I'm going to direct that to uh, Mr. Menon's committee because that's where the list came from curriculum instruction and um, accountability so um, I think we get a lot of work done in our subcommittees and then the, when the reports come out there um, they're good so can you put that on your agenda for your next meeting to take a look at the school committee developed calendar and see if we need to make adjustments one of them being goals discussions periodically in case you didn't get some of that any other comments about this process we just went through? Thank you. I think it articulates superintendent's report. Okay. I have some reading for you tonight. Some more reading for you tonight. Um, one of the things that I want that I will um, start doing for you on a regular basis is I want to share with you the position papers that the um, Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents comes out with because I think you need to be familiar with those as well as mm -hmm. <coughs> as I do um, so I, I have provided you or I am providing you tonight with uh, behavioral health and social emotional intelligence the executive summary position paper I'm providing you with a copy of mass supports the common core and why I am providing you with um, the Common Core repeal ballot question talking points about that because there's a lot of talk out there about that and why we don't think that that's a good idea and then also our statement on charter schools um, and th this really is just for um, your own knowledge so that you can know where the superintendents group stands on this and I will make sure mm -hmm. that um, both Mayor Holiday and uh, Mr. Hawkeiser received copies of this as well. But it's interesting reading and it will give you some, it will give you the perspective of where the superintendent's organization is coming from. And I do have to say that, that I'm, I've said this before, but this is a very strong organization of superintendents and they really value input from their members in terms of putting these together. 
and we have an opportunity to comment on things. We have an opportunity to be on some of the committees. So, um, but it, I think you'll find it interesting reading. And then um, the, the other thing that I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about tonight, it's two weeks before um, opening day of school, and we still are hiring. We still have positions to fill. Uh, we have been um, unable to find a psychologist, which is, um, and we're, we're still looking for some other part-time positions. Um, I do have some candidates coming in that I'm meeting with next week who have been recommended to me. Um, but we've had, um, we recently had a physical therapist resign. And so we are, we have to replace that position as well. But we're gonna look at that a little bit differently. I think we may look at um, perhaps a, a physical therapy assistant. I guess the, um, <coughs> it's my own, I'm not commenting on the committee, I'm commenting myself. I'm really concerned about the psychologist, yes. and I'm sure you are. I just wanted to say that again out loud, because so many things, um, there's such a balance at the high school, and, you know, changing people's positions and working, you know, with current staff, um, I, I, I really hope we find someone. I just... You know, I mean, we can limp along for a short period of time, but that's know, not what we want to do. No, so. no, no. And that's really it. Um, I'm just going to ask you, and if you're not prepared, it's okay. Remember, we were going to visit again the fifth grade class size, and has there been any change in the determination there? Um, because uh, we were going to put that on the agenda. Um, we've got 100 and. We have, according to Tara, I met with Tara on. Today is Monday. I met with Tara on Thursday last week, and she said that in our fifth grades, they are either 23 or 24. And that is typically what they, they have been up there, mm -hmm. 22, 23, 24. And are, we're not anticipating a flux of new this, at, at this point? No. I mean, we've, we've, had, we've had a number of new students move into both the fourth and fifth grade, okay. but, we're, 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 but we're keeping an eye on it. Okay. We're definitely keeping an eye on it. And what about the kindergarten situation? Kindergarten situation, we are currently at seven sections, not eight. Right. And we've got 100, and, do we have any more enrolled than, we had 127 two weeks ago. Um, I don't, I have not asked Amy if any new ones have come in in the okay. last two weeks. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so just to keep. Yeah, I think we would have heard. Yeah. Um, just to well, keep us updated on that. I know there are four more at the high school. My daughter mentioned it today. She said New students? Four more since she gave the figures the last time. High school, we have an easier time absorbing students. Right. It, they're not so much homeroom oriented, you know. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Super, uh, <coughs> Assistant Superintendent's report. Um, I'm just wanted to fill no. I no, just wanted okay. to fill you in on um, briefly, just so we're getting prepared for our new hires. Um, next week we'll be orienting them to the district, and we'll pro be providing them a full day of professional development to help them acclimate here. So we're very busy right now with that, getting them ready. We're also working with the leadership team, helping the leadership team get ready for rolling out the strategic plan here mm -hmm. in just a couple of weeks too. So that's just a big broad stroke, but just to let you know what we're busy with right now. I'm gonna ask you one question. Mm -hmm. How is our mentoring program? It's great. It's it's alive and well and each new person has a mentor. And well. and we haven't talked about that in a long time. Yeah. And well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I met with, we met with um, some of our teachers. We put out an opportunity last year for mentors in the district to participate in a uh, graduate level course around mentoring, um, an opportunity to really expand some of the skill that they have. And then um, the mentor leaders and myself met with those teachers to hear their recommendations. But our teachers were so impressive during the class that the instructor mm. got in touch with me and asked if she could come and meet with me to talk about 
some of the things that our teachers had said about the things that were happening already in our district. And so we had a great meeting. This was last spring. We had a great meeting. We talked about things that um, are in the program that currently we're not doing, and we talked about things that we're doing that aren't even a part of the program that they wanted to learn about too. So it was a great collaborative conversation. And, um, and then our mentor leaders went on to spend another full day with the teachers who had participated in the class and talk about the aspects of what they learned um, and how we might like to incorporate that into our programming uh, for this year. But one of the strengths I, I really feel very strongly about from our mentoring program is that at the end of every year, all of our mentors and all of our mentees uh, write a three-page mm -hmm. reflection mm -hmm. about their experience. And, um, and we read those very carefully, and we base what happens the following year on that feedback. So every year the program's evolved, and I think gotten better. And, um, and, and something you, we're really proud of. And there's a, there are a lot of statistics out there that, that talk about how in the first three years of a teacher's life, mentoring mm -hmm. is a critical component mm -hmm. to getting mm -hmm. into the fourth and fifth year. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad I asked you that question because um, you just gave us some great information about here we are again on the cutting edge of programming. And I haven't heard about mentoring for a while. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, and I value that as a strategy for it. Yeah, in, it's great. In October or November every year, I set up three or four after-school meetings where I send out an invitation to all new staff that have been hired. And I s simply say to them, pick, a pick one of the dates that works for you and come and spend half an hour with me. So I'll have five or six of the new staff. And I invite everybody. I invite teacher assistants. I invite teachers. And I just say to them, mm. how was your entrance into the district. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, think back, you know, the last couple of months, how has it been? What kind of feedback have you had? The teachers always talk about the mentoring program. I can tell uh, you that. Good. And good. the teacher assistants, upon hearing about the teacher's mentoring program, are actually thinking about that they may want to start something like that with more experienced Teacher assistants mentoring younger is so brand new. Be careful what you bring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a great problem, though. I think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I, I really do. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. You're um, was, do you have something else? No, that was okay. All. I don't think any of our subcommittees have, have met over the summer, but I'm most interested in uh, Mr. Uh, Menon, your curriculum instruction and accountability, and have you got um, have you and your committee set a time. Um, I would like to set, I won't be here for the 22nd, but I would like to set the 29th as a date for the meeting. But, but what is your ongoing calendar? I, oh, you, uh, were, you were thinking yeah, about doing over. alternate to the school committee meeting right, on Monday. a Monday night. Right. Would it be the second Monday or the thir fourth Monday? Um, my preference would be the fourth Monday. Can we settle on that so that we sure. have that in our? Absolutely. Because the um the other thing I want to mention about our subcommittees is um, as we begin to meet, I would hope that each subcommittee chair would uh, bring up the notion of goals for the year for their committee, so that I know. But I <laughs> We've heard enough about policy. We don't need to know what your goals are, but. Oh, you will. Just so that we all know what, what we're working on and what we're hoping to attain this year, because I don't want to do the work for, you know, it's not for no reason, but I think we need, the more we articulate what we're doing and communicating with people in the community about what, in, what our subcommittee work entails and the fact that, you know, we talked about all the work we do isn't always in this room all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think we've gotten really strong in doing our feedback mechanism, and I think our subcommittees are working well. Um, we're getting a lot accomplished, so I just want to do whatever I can do to make sure that continues. Hey. Bruce, what time on the 29th? Uh, what time do you suggest? I mean, I think 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock? Mm -hmm. Who else is committee? on that committee? Uh, Davis, Nick, can you make that a 5 o'clock meeting? Can you make a 5 o'clock mm -hmm. meeting? Yep. Great. Okay. And then we'll go with the fourth, the fourth Monday. Therefore, mm -hmm. okay, great. Thanks. Well, Thanks. That helps. Five Thank would be you. Better, but I can make okay. Is there anything else? We do not need to have an executive session this evening. 
So I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Mm -hmm. I'll second it. Okay. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Aye. Our meeting has concluded.